So here we are, straying pilgrims, but we're staying on topic. Today's text, Jeremiah 47 through 4430. We covered some of this last week, um, kind of. We kind of didn't cover it also, so we're going to look at it again. We are either here, because as I said, uh, it's the seventh month in chapter 41, which may mean that I got this out of position. Or, if these events are what trigger immediately Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, to come back when he does in 582, then maybe these events are somewhere closer to 582. That's reasonable? I don't know. Probably the seventh month from, uh, probably supposed to be here and not over there, for what it's worth. As a way of reminder, in chapter 40, the first six verses they had given Jeremiah the option, look, where do you want to go? Here's, here's some rations, here's some, a gift, where do you want to go? And he goes to, uh, he decides to stay in the Holy Land, and they are, in, ooh, oh no, horrible. They are in Mizpah. Well, that's it. <laughs> On the other map, that was Mizpah. You, you, you went back to Florida. Yeah, but not here. They're in Mizpah. Okay, that's where they are. All right, so there we are. They're in Mizpah and in chapter 40, verse 7. Now all the commanders of the forces that were in the field, they and their men heard the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahi, come over the land, and that he had put in charge of them men, women, and children, those of the poorest of the land who had not been exiled to Babylon. So they came to Gedaliah at Mizpah, along with Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and Johanan, or Johanan, and uh, Jothan, Jonathan, the sons of Korea, and some others, I'm going to skip their names. Then, Gedaliah, verse 9, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, swore to them, saying, Do not be afraid of serving the Chaldeans. Stay in the land, serve the king of Babylon, that it may go well with you. We pointed out last week, again, that Jeremiah had already written to those who were in Babylon, Stay there, live there, be faithful. And now here Jeremiah is, or uh, Gedaliah is saying, stay here, be here, be faithful, and that'll go well. But same message on in either place. Verse 10, as for me, I'm going to stay at Mizpah and stand for you before the Chaldeans who come to us. But as for you, gather in the wine, the summer fruit, the oil, put them in your storage vessels and live in your cities that you have taken over. Likewise, also all the Jews who were in Moab among the sons of Ammon and Edom who were in all the other countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant in Judah and he had appointed over them Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan. Then all the Jews returned from all the places to which they had driven, been driven away and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah at Mizpah and gathered in wine and summer fruit in great abundance. So it's, there's a good start. We pointed out last week, just because there's a good start doesn't mean it's time to relax, right? The farmer's having a good season. He says, okay, I don't got to do any more work. No, that's not the way it works, right? They keep on keeping on everybody, not only the farmer, everybody, especially those of us who are in self-employed, we understand what that means. Okay. Verse 13, now Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces that were in the field came to get Eli at Mizpah and said to him, Are you well aware that Baalis, the king of the sons of Ammon, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to take your life? Now that's the guy that he had just we had just read about him in verse 7 and 8. Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah. So they're coming up and say, That guy, one of ours, is here to kill you. Then Johanan, verse 15, well, I'm sorry, verse 14, the end of it says, but Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, did not believe them. Then Johanan, the son of Korea, spoke secretly to Gedaliah and Mizpah, saying, let me go and kill Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and not a man will know. Why should he take your life so that all the Jews who are gathered to you would be scattered and the remnant of Judah would perish? But Gedaliah said to Ahikam, the son of Ahikam said to Joanan, do not do this thing for you are telling a lie about Ishmael. Okay, last week I posed to you that uh, maybe he was loving all things and believing all things 
And that could be true because we are supposed to love and believe and hope all things about who? Everybody, really, right? Except when there is a credible evidence or threat. Deuteronomy 19 tells them that if somebody rises up and starts saying something about somebody else, then you are to investigate it. Right. Deuteronomy 19, 15. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in the office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly. Otherwise, if you don't investigate thoroughly, and it turns out that the threat was credible and real, well, you can have some problems, which is illustrated in Jeremiah. We know the rest of the story. He dies. Because apparently he didn't invest it. No, you're lying, and, and dropped it. And the next thing we know, he's dead. Now, there was a literal assassination in Jeremiah 40. Have you ever heard of a character assassination? In fact, that's exactly what he's talking about here in Deuteronomy 19. There might be some among you that are trying to character assassinate somebody else. Does anybody remember where this is quoted? One of the places it's quoted in the New Testament. Not on a single witness but on account of one or more. Okay, Matthew 18. What, what did you say? I was thinking of with the elders. Thank you. That's where I'm really going. Because he quotes, well, he doesn't quote, it might be a quote, it's at least an illusion, right? So 1 Timothy chapter 5, what's going on? Oh, what's going on in that situation? Everybody's just behaving wonderfully. No. At least one person, no matter what, somebody is doing something wrong. Right? In 1 Timothy chapter 5. Verse 17, the elders who rule, rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor. Yes, good for that elder. But not all elders rule well. Verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. The point being is, there may be an accusation against this elder that's true. And if you've got two or three witnesses, then you go with that. But the threat is also there that somebody might just not like that elder and stand up and character assassinate him. Go ahead. I mean, as a person has thought it, unfortunately, I could see this happening too, if the person has thought it through well enough, that they could have two or three people say this. That's why you need to actually investigate it also, not just take it on more than, take it on a few people. Right. Right, even if it's false, there might be a group of them. That uh, Israel did it with ten people, I think it was in, in uh, Jeremiah forty-four or forty. Yeah, he had ten people. Yeah, so so we have to look. We love all things. We love all. We hope all things. Believe all things. We don't love all things. Uh, you know about people, but but at the same time, hey, somebody said this. Okay, I, I'm I'm not gonna. I can hear both sides, but I'm not gonna just dismiss it totally. No, I, I, we can't do that. that we're setting ourselves up for failure. Uh, Paul writes that such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. I wouldn't ever believe that of that person. Be careful. Because the person who will do it is not going to have horns. You know, they are going to disguise themselves as apostle of light. By the way, no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. And the context is, people are saying about Paul, he's not an apostle. Character assassination, right? Okay, so there's a threat. Paul, when he heard about a threat to the Lord's body in Corinth, what did he do? Oh, I just don't. He heard about it from Chloe's people. And he said, oh, you're telling a lie. No. He wrote him a really long <laughs> <He> wrote him. <laughs> <laughs> Right? John writes 
3rd John about Diotrephes. Now that's a really short letter. But when he, he, apparently he knows of the situation and he's not there because he writes them a letter and he says, you all who are talking about Diotrephes that way, you're just lying. No. He's investigated okay because these things do happen. So we need to keep our eyes open. That's, that's the whole point. Love uh, does believe all things and hope all things and love also considers all things, right? All right, so back here in Jeremiah 41. I'm done with that. Anybody comment or question? Yeah, Jonathan, I thought you were. Uh, I probably should have asked this in the last couple of classes, but you mentioned being to this one, so I'll ask it now. Um, has not Jeremiah been running around saying, God wants you to just go ahead to Babylon? He had been, yes. Before... If they would just go to Babylon, go out to the king, they would they would avoid the king coming to them. They didn't go, so the king came to them. And now now the situation changed. Okay, so I, uh, the whole go wherever you want, and then Jeremiah says, well, I guess I'll stay here. Has been peeing around in my head. It hasn't even saying just go ahead and go, but it's because that. Opportunity New paradigm, past paradigm past shift. Past and yeah. Okay. He wasn't so much saying go to Babylon as, as to serve them. Right? Go out to the surrender. Just, just here. No, but I mean, oh, oh, right then. then. Yeah, yeah, Zedekiah, go to the king yeah, of Babylon, serve him. who's probably up here at uh, in Damascus or right. something like that. Serve him, yeah. and he'll let you stay here and you'll right. annihilate you. Right. 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 Yeah, that's, that's a valid point to be clear. Jeremiah wasn't really saying literally go to Babylon. Okay. So chapter 41, in the seventh, so continuing the story. Don't believe it, you're telling a lie. So in the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama of the royal family, and one of the chief officers of the king, along with ten men, came to Mizpah to give Eliah to the son of Ahikam. While they were eating bread together there in Mizpah, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and ten men who were with him arose and struck down Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and put to death the one whom the king of Babylon had appointed over the land. Okay, when you kill the king's servant, who are you warring against? Who are you hitting? You're, you're killing the king himself, right? Right. So this is, in, he's instigated, and probably on, it doesn't say it, but I'm guessing he does on purpose. So I, maybe I should hold that comment to myself. Ishmael also struck down all the Jews who were with him, and that is with Gedaliah and Mizpah. And the Chaldeans were found there, the men of war. So, I mean, it's, this is obvious. It's blatant. Whether or not it's actually on purpose, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to instigate him. That is what he's doing. Now, it happened on the next day after killing Gedaliah, when no one knew about it, that 80 men came from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, with their beards shaved off and their clothes torn. By the way, where are these people coming from? Not actually within Judah. The point is, there are still people faithful to, Je to Jehovah living outside of Judah, up in the land. Um, they shaved off, shaved off their and their clothes torn and their bodies gashed, having grain offerings and incense in their hands to bring to the house of the Lord, or what was left of the house of the Lord, which is rubble. Then Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went out to Mizpah to meet them, weeping as he went. And he met them and said to them, Come to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. Yet it turned out, as soon as they came inside the city, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the men who were with him, slaughtered them and cast them into the cistern. But ten men who found who were found among them said to Ishmael, Do not put us to death, for we have stores of wheat, barley, oil, hidden and honey hidden in the field. So he refrained and did not put them to death, along with their companions. Now, as for the cistern where Ishmael had cast all the corpses of the men whom he had struck down because of Gedaliah, it was the one that King Asa had made on account of Basha, king of Ishmael. Uh, Israel. Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, filled it with the slain. Then Ishmael took captive all the remnant of the people who were in Mizpah, the king's daughters, and all the people who were left in Mizpah, whom Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, had put under the charge of Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. Thus Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, took them captive and proceeded to cross over to the sons of Ammon. So now he's taking them all, and he's going to the Ammonites. All right. 
But Yohanan, here we are, we have this guy again, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces that were with him, were with him heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done. So they took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and they found him by the great pool that is in Gibeon. Now as soon as all the people who were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Korea, and the commanders of the forces that were with him, they were glad. So all the people whom Ishmael had taken captive from Mizpah turned around and came back and went to Johanan, the son of Korea. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the sons of Ammon. And he got away with murder, didn't he? Right. He doesn't get away with murder because in the very passage we were reading before, 1 Timothy 5, the sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. And he got what was coming to him. Unless he repented and asked God for forgiveness, no matter what, he got what was coming to him, right? Uh, one could have disputed the way I phrased that better, right? Because if he was repented and received mercy, then he did not get what was coming to him. Right. So I ask every night, I ask every Sunday and every Thursday, I ask my children, I say, what did you learn in Bible class? And for months they said, we didn't have Bible class, Daddy. And I said, yes, you did. You were in it. And then they quick think and say something. Well, Nikolai said, I learned that Johann, uh, that uh, Ishmael got away with murder. And I looked at Nikolai and I said, did he get away with murder? And he said, no, because God knew. <laughs> That's right. So he's doing well. A couple things from this. Maybe you have some points. Number one, when things are going well, when things get going well, verse 12 of chapter 40, the summer, everything's going well, that's when the work starts. Right? When things are going well in your life, in the congregation, that's what I'm thinking of. The congregation's going well. That's when the work is beginning. Right? The work is beginning every day that you're waking up. So don't let your guard down. Right? Oh, man, things are going great. Yep, good. The work is still... The one expected to lead. Verse chapter 41. Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama. Now what are the next words? Of the royal family. Sadder words have never been spoken. The one who was supposed to lead them. God's, of God's chosen family. Is the one that destroys them or leads to their destruction. Not all leaders lead, do they? Not all leaders care. Some only care for themselves. So the lesson is, for them, the royal family was chosen by God. Our leaders, we choose in one way. We need to be very careful. Enemies without and enemies within. What do you do in this situation? There's Balas, the king of the Ammonites. There, he's trying to get us. He's trying to get us using somebody that's within us. There's enemies without, enemies within. What do you do in that situation? Nothing different than if you've got friends without and friends within. It doesn't matter what the situation is. You are always faithful to God. That's what you do in that situation, right? James chapter 1. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Now, this is going to go both ways, but in chapter 1, it is primarily talking about people who are being picked on by their brethren. Chapter 2 talks about the rich man. The rich man, there's three people. There's a person who sees a rich man and a poor man. And this person who sees those two says to the rich man, come in and take the good seat. And he says to the poor man, you sit over there. And when he does that, how does the poor man feel? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Why? What's the threat? That when somebody picks on you, you might what? Retaliate. So you've got an enemy without, and you've got an enemy within. What do you do? What's God's advice? Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. How am I going 
going to get through this without my tongue going in a direction it shouldn't go. I'm just going to pray to God and say, God, help me. I've got an enemy without, and I've got one right here. Lord, help me. And then number two, so we ask His, we seek His wisdom, and then we apply His wisdom. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, his religion is worth it. You can sit in here all day long, but as soon as you go out there and your tongue goes flying off, th this doesn't do you any good, right? Part of that wisdom is um, uh, vengeance is mine, say the Lord. Yes. I will repay. But also it's uh, be kind to your enemies and you will keep burning coals yep. on his head. Yep. Right? Um, not that, not That's not a bad thing. But he's yep. going to keep them there himself yep. because he knows that you're a better person than what he is. Yeah. Make, it, make it real obvious to him. And perhaps change his heart, perhaps not, but you've done the right thing, my boy. Right. A few bad apples spoiled the good progress. What were you? I was talking to him. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Ethan. Just a side note, it doesn't say anything in 41, so I assume it's supposed to be a little bit of a question. Since he takes um, in verse 10, he takes takes the people captive who are left at Mizpah. Um, Jeremiah was in Mizpah at the time, right? Okay. Yeah, he's been jerked mention, around. It doesn't mention him right here. So I just make sure. I'm just making sure. Like, I yeah, I mean, he last we knew, he went to get a lie at Mizpah, and then Mizpah is taken over. So, I mean, maybe something's missing. And next thing we know, he's in Egypt with them. So it seems... Yes, yes, right, right, we'll get there. So a few bad apples spoil the whole bunch here. You know, this, the, the things were going well, and there weren't a lot of them to begin with, but out of the group, there were 10, 11 people, I guess, I don't know how many people, who came along and spoiled it for everybody. And that's why Gedaliah, if he had been a better and wiser leader, would have heard the threat and investigated it. Right? Because, there, this, yeah, it's possible that a few of our own people can spoil it for the rest of us. And the New Testament gives us instructions. Yes, th there might be a situation. Look, you got to go deal with this. Here, here are the situation. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, that can talk about, <laughs> I've got pride and in myself. That can destroy the rest of me. My pride can destroy the rest of me. It also applies to one bad egg. No one bad apple spoils the whole. Right. Whatever. You get what I'm talking about here. Another point. There is a big life change for these people. Especially the commanders. The commanders of the forces. Now, I'm not here to suggest that that's all they ever did. But next thing you know, the commanders of the forces, who have been fighting for years now, are told, serve that man you've been told, you've been fighting so far, and serve him by picking your vines. Life change. Does life change for us sometimes? Death, divorce, loss of a job, that, that can be big. What do you do? The same thing you always do. Right? It's not easy for me to say, I've had a pretty easy life. And so it's easy for me to stand up and say, you got to be faithful. But that's not really me saying it, it's God saying it. Look, we have to be faithful. By the way, all the chaos, oh, well, yeah, we can make this point now. All the chaos going on, where is this chaos going on? In God's land and among whom is this chaos happening? God's people. Boy, are they doing a good job bringing glory to God. And yet these are the very ones who are saying, we are few, but we have the land. Go far from the land, God has given us the land. And God looks at them and says, you sin after sin after sin. You're not in this land because you're special, right? Okay. So, chapter 41, verse 16. Oh, by the way, this guy, Johanan. So, then Johanan, the son of Korea. All right, this guy, we know four things about him so far. Number one, 
He came with the commanders to Mizpah. Get Elias in Mizpah. He's leading the jewel, Jews. Here comes Johanna. Not all of them came. He did. That's good. Number two, he served the way he ought to. Gedaliah said, go out there, work the fields, and everything will go well with you. Well, he was one of those out there working the fields. Number three, he wanted to protect the king. Or he's not a king, he's a vassal king or whatever, the governor, or whatever you want to go. He wanted to protect him. He said, look, hey, there's a threat out there. And number four, when Ishmael took all the people, he went and rescued all the people and brings them back to the promised land. Now, what happens? This is what I call a good start for a guy. Hey, that, 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 that sounds good. We like him so far. Then Johan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces were with him, took from Mizpah all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, after he had struck down Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, that is, the men who were soldiers, the women, the children, the eunuchs, whom he had brought back from Gibeon. And they went and stayed in Geruth Kimam, which is beside Bethlehem, in order to proceed into Egypt. What? They had been told, stay in the land. In order to proceed to Egypt. Wait a minute, what? Sometimes, some of God's people will cause others of God's people to say, what? Wait a minute. What did he do? What did she do? Her? At the same time, and that's a valid point, at the same time, how many times a day do I cause God to say, what did he do again? Lee blew it again. Lee did a, wait a minute, what? He was doing all right here, and then he did this? I just don't understand it, so be careful. They went because of fear. Because of the Chaldeans, they were afraid of them. Fear causes you to think funny things. I got an idea. I'm afraid, I'm scared. I guess the first thing that you should probably do is throw that first idea out the door, right? I'm scared, I got an idea. Okay, throw that one away. What was the answer to their fear? How can they overcome fear? There's only one answer. Trust, faith. That's the answer. Look. Anybody ever been scared of something? Yeah, you know what? Even even the night you're two Christians, relatively mature, will say they're going to get married. The night before, there is a question: Am I doing what is best for me, for her, for my children, for my grandchildren? There's a tiny bit of fear. Well. Trust God. Right? <laughs> Reconsider everything. Right? That everybody's got some fear. Even the best things in our lives usually have a little bit of fear associated with them. And then there are the other decisions. Man, this is thrown at me. What am I going to do? My kid's in the hospital. This is going on. George is in the hospital at 27 with, an, with a heart attack. Little fear there? I was scared. Trust God. You want to say something? Um, even more so in this yeah, everything you're saying here, I don't disagree with. It says that, you know, I mean, these things will come up that were thrown at you, and you're not sure what to do, and you have to trust. In this instance, what what faith and trust would actually look like is just simple obedience, because it was spelled out to them. It was right in front of them. You know, they were told they were supposed to do. They had fear, and it, and their fear wasn't based on the fact that they didn't know. <laughs> they knew. Right. It was, and and very often that's probably the case with us as well. Yes. Life throws curveballs, um, and we need to not fear that. But, you know, I'm afraid. I'm in a situation where it feels like I should be sitting. Well, no. <laughs> you shouldn't. Right. You shouldn't. It, this, this one's an obvious call. Right, an obvious. Yeah, th yeah. this one's an obvious call. Fear was, I think, more misplaced than it was. It shouldn't have been there. Always. Lucky on a major world conquest. 
stack a, another mistake on top of another mistake. Yeah. And I think the big, uh, the, the whole situation kind of feels like to one of them, do I give up or not? And, and so it's never give up, never give up, never give up. Never Throw give more up. money at it. What's that? Throw more money at it. Well, yeah, but never give up. Never yeah. give up. And it seems like going back to Babylon and going to Babylon is, is giving up now to go to Egypt, which is absolutely giving up and actually the wrong thing. But, but it's like, why would I want to work and, and uh, serve that other king over there when I should be in the land that God promised me? Right. Uh, but the point is that Jeremiah is there, and he has proven... <laughs> Yep. Events have proven his ability to speak God's word to them, and they should have. They should have listened. They did. Right. So, chapter forty-two, verse one. Then all the commanders of the forces, Joanan the son of Korea, Jezaniah the son of Hoshaya, and all the people, both small and great, approached. In other words, everybody. So this is a group effort. That's the author is trying to point that out. Group effort going on here. And said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please let our petition come before you and pray for us to the Lord your God, that is for all the remnant, because we are left but a few out of many as your own eyes now see us. That the Lord may, your God may tell us the way in which we should walk and the thing that we should do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard you. Behold, I am going to pray to the Lord your God in accordance with your words. And I will tell you the whole message which the Lord will answer you. I will not keep back a word from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, May the Lord be true and faithful witness against we, uh, if against us if we do not act in accordance with the whole message which the Lord your God will send to us, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant. We will listen to the voice of the Lord our God to whom we are sending you so that it may go well with us when we listen to the voice of the Lord our God. I can't tell you a better beginning. Better words were never spoken. Pray for us. Hey, great. Followed with, we'll do it. Great. That's two greats. Followed with, it doesn't matter if it hurts us or it feels good. We're going to do it. Whatever it is, God says, we'll do it. Now, you know the rest of the story. I have heard people say prayers that cause other people to cry during the prayer. You can hear it. Only to later on find out that the one saying the prayer was living in sin. He knew the right words to say. He can fool those people, but he can't fool God. They say all the right words. I mean, they're perfect. But you already know in the reply, Jeremiah's reply, I'm going to tell you everything. I'm going to tell you the whole message. I'm not going to hold anything back. Jeremiah already knows what's going on with these people. It sounds like that when they said, tell us the way which we should go, in verse 3, it sounds like they are thinking, well, we know where we're going. We're going to Egypt. Now, God, please tell us to go by the north route or the south route. They're, they're wanting God to answer their prayer the way they want it answered. Right. Yeah. They want God to fit into their box. Yeah. They've overlooked should they go and they've jumped right to how they will go. We're going to go, God, so please bless us. Right, exactly. This, you've heard the phrase, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. This is like, <laughs> I better say to it ask all the forgiveness time. for permission. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. And, you know, people do this all the time. Now, I can think of one illustration that I, I see it crops up everywhere. I'm going to get that job. That's the job that's good for me. Now, God, how do I get that job? Without considering the fact that that job is not, and, and everybody else can see. No, that's not. It may even be a job that is, requires sin, or it may be a job that that is just not a good fit for you in your situation right now. Everybody else sees it, and they're praying, oh, God, how can I get that job? As opposed to, should I actually have that job, right? I, I see these kind of things all You might see your own people. We do that. I need to be careful. Look, I want this thing. I want it. I want it, right? Uh, where are we going to 
move to someday if we ever move. I want to move over here. Marcy wants to move over there. Marcy doesn't want to move over there. Marcy wants to move over here. Okay, slow down. What would be best as far as bringing glory to God? That's what we need. That's what we need to be thinking about. By the way, God allowed them progress, didn't he? They progressed all the way to Egypt. He did not stop them from doing the dumb thing. He didn't stop them. He allowed them to make progress, just like when they were moving the ark on the cart. They made progress until death happened. In both situations, progress until death. So the idea is, the, the principle is, look, you, you examine your situation, and just because things are going for you does not still does not mean that God approves of what you're doing, right? Oh, I got the job. God must have wanted me to get the job. Because I got the job. No. No, that's not the way God works. Comments or questions here? It's the idea of God wants me to be happy. Yeah. Boy, that falls into I mean, you've been a right. thousand things into that. You know. Wow. Yeah. God allows progress as kind of an extension of free will existing at all. And yes. And the ability to have faith. Jews, that became Phariseeism right there. That's what you just described. They, it wasn't about how to please God. It was about how can I live in such a way that I will not die. And so they set up all these rules, all these rules, all these rules, and more rules and more rules. It's not a far jump from the, the, the perspective behind if God, if, if I am doing it, then God must approve of it. That perspective is not a far jump from, oh, God moved me to do it. You know, God, 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 God told me to. You've heard the language. You know, God moved me to do this. Wait a minute, <laughs> right? Okay. So you know the story. Verse seven. At the end of ten days, all the while God is giving them the opportunity to what? Repent. Wait a minute. Should we be going to Egypt? Should we actually be going there? But instead, probably they were becoming... Remember, their motivation is fear. And God keeps them in that spot. A little bit longer. A little bit longer. A little bit longer. A little bit longer. I imagine that played well into their anxiety. So they should have been doing what? While they're anxious. Pray. Cast your cares on the Lord. Pray to Him. And meanwhile, maybe you'll figure it out. Wait, you know, we're not supposed to be going there. I'll just put a little faith in God, right? Okay. At the end of ten days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. He called for Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces that were with him. Verse 10. If you will indeed stay in this land, then I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and I will not uproot you, root you. For I will relent concerning the calamity I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon. That is their exact problem. I'm afraid. He says to them, don't be afraid. Whom you are now fearing, do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord. For I am with you to save you, to deliver you from his hand. And I will also show you compassion so that, listen, so that he will have compassion on you and restore you. God has the ability, even though you've ticked off the king of the world, king of the world, who's, they're all known to be angry and fly off the, wall, fly off the handle at, at any little thing. God says, that king that you're scared of, I can make him have compassion on you. Trust me. If you trust me, it'll go well with you. Verse 13, but if you are going to say, oh, by the way, verse 12, I will show compassion on you, he will have compassion on you, and restore you to your own soil. He'll put you back. Remember chapter 40? They had a great abundance of summer fruit and gathered in wine. Everything's going wonderful. I can put you right back there like nothing in the middle ever happened. 
But if you are going to say, we are not going to stay in this land, so as not to listen to the voice of the Lord your God, saying no, but we will go to the land of Egypt where we will not see war. Remember, this is what they're saying. If we go there, we won't see war. Well, you know the end. Verse 16 talks about they'll be taken, overtaken by the sword and by famine. It will, verse 16, it will follow closely after you there. It's a picture, picture of them running from a sword. That's the point that he wants to make the picture. Verse 17, all the men who set their mind to go to Egypt will reside there, will die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence, these sea free threatened threats. And they will have no survivors or refugees from the calamity that I'm going to bring on them. For, thus says the Lord of hosts, as my anger and wrath have been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so my wrath, my wrath will be poured out on you when you enter Egypt, and you will become a curse. Verse 19, the Lord has spoken to you, O remnant of Judah, do not go to Egypt. You should clearly understand that today I have testified against you. For you have not only deceived, you have only deceived yourselves. For it is you who sent me to the Lord your God, praying, saying, Pray for us to the Lord your, our God. And whatever the Lord says, tell us so, and we will do it. So I have told you today, but you have not obeyed the Lord your God, even in whatever he has sent me to tell you. Therefore, you should now clearly understand that you will die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence in the place where you wish to go and reside. Wow. <laughs> Notice he says several times, you should clearly understand. They ask him, should we go? He says, no, 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 no. If you go here, it will be well for you. If you go there, you're all going to die. You should clearly understand. I'm testifying against you. And so they obeyed him because they wanted to, right? But they had promised. Remember, they had promised, whatever you say, we'll do it. Yeah, but Jeremiah said you guys were hypocrites. Yes. So I guess you can say something and not really mean it? Is that possible? So my son reminded me in a conversation. He didn't remind me because he didn't know. <laughs> Many years ago, I read a book, The Stainless Steel. In the book, this actually that wasn't the name of it. That's another book by the same author. So Harry Harrison is the author. So so this this space traveler is traveling through space, and he ends up in a culture where there are walking and talking lizards. And the thing is, is they cannot tell a lie. They cannot tell a lie. So everything they say is always the truth. They always speak the truth. The human is captured by them, and he gets out by, guess what? Lying, because they, they've never seen a lie before. These people here are not like the lizard men in the story, are they? No. They say, look, I promise to do whatever he says, and then they don't do it at all. They do the exact opposite. They do what they said they wouldn't. Sometimes people can say things and not mean it. Now, we need to be watchful that somebody is not saying to me something and not meaning it, and I need to be careful that I am not saying, God, by the way, in, you know the rest of the story, chapter 43, as soon as Jeremiah was done, they said no. But they, they promised, and as soon as they got the answer, they said no, but they promised. So I guess a promise can be exposed as a lie immediately. Actually, it was 10 days later. So their commitment wasn't actually as binding, was it? Because it was 10 days later. That, I mean, they said, we'll do it, and then they had to wait 10 days. So their commitment wasn't as much, was it? When did you commit? Gary, do you remember when you committed to do everything God said? Do you remember? The exact year. Yeah, day? No. Anybody in here? No? No. I, I, you, that's okay. I, yeah, yeah I, not everybody remembers. Not, not I, January 10th, 19, uh, 1998. January 10th, 1998, I said to God, whatever you say, I'll do it. No, I have not kept my end of the deal. I know that. But the point is, it doesn't matter if it's been as soon as he said the answer, or 10 whole days, or 20 years, 
when you said you'd do it, that's when you committed, and from then on, you're bound to your word, right? I find it interesting that they were in this little land, they were in Judah, they're in Mizpah, or right around there, and they're scared of the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon is the, the, the most powerful king in the world at that time. The most powerful king in the world is going to become bearing down on them with horses and chariots ready to conquer them, and they're backed into the corner. And have they ever escaped out of that kind of a situation before? That's exactly the situation at the parting of the Red Sea. They're in this, God backs them into this corner where they can't do anything but pray to Him. They had that story. They knew that story. But yet, they didn't take it into account, did they? They knew why God, God says, I'll tell you why I did that. Right. <laughs> Jonathan. That story, interestingly enough, was specifically about Egypt. <laughs> the, they're trying to run away from the Chaldeans because he's a scary guy who's beating up on God's people. And the situation is out of control. Right. So they want to go to a place, and if a Jew hears it, Egypt, they should be thinking, that was 400 years of terrible, and we're not there now. How did that happen? Oh, God brought us out. So clearly, God can do some major key influencing for a bad, scary dude beating up on God's people. Selective memory and mental gymnastics. That's what fear caused in them. So it can do it to me, too. Why, why am I doing this stupid thing? By the way, at every opportunity they had to stop doing this stupid thing, what would it have taken? Say it. Yeah, humility. Yes, humility. I'm going for, I phrased that horribly, I'm going for faith. That, that's what it would. Uh, okay, God said, I, I found myself in the dumb, I thought the dumb thing, and now I'm in it. And it's, it's not good. It's going to get worse. What can you do? By faith. Stop the dumb thing and, and do whatever he said. Stop it. it. But it'll take faith. But yes, as soon as you stop it, guess what you're doing? You're exercising your faith. Go you. Good for you, right? I'm in this situation. Whatever your situation is, you know you found yourself there. I'm doing this silly thing. And it looks like it's going to keep on going, but it doesn't have to. And as soon as you say, no, I will do what's right, what's true, and what's good. You are exercising your faith. And I like that when I do that. Yay me, right? Oh, oh yes. Even if, you know, we're not always going to have this obvious connection between what we want to do is wrong and why we shouldn't be doing it, as they did with the Egypt thing. They, they should have thought Egypt in a sentence and then thought, no, wait a minute, this thing we're trying to do is not. That strong, close, obvious of connection isn't always going to be there. But there's a whole book of Pretty much every situation you could possibly imagine that we should be able to look at or considering anything and think, well, where's the one that makes it obvious why what I want to do and kind of really know that I shouldn't be doing says I shouldn't do it because God will take care of me. Yeah. There's an example of that somewhere in there, and there's probably a whole lot of them. Yes. So we got to know the text because the text will point out to us it's the mirror for us and for our situation. Look. This situation is another, I'm talking to a donkey situation. I shouldn't be talking to a donkey because it's dumb. The situation, wherever I got here, it's dumb and it's my fault, right? So it's one of those. Gary, you want to? I, I did. 40, 42 makes this. Here they are in a bad situation. How, how am I going to get saved out of this bad situation? You know, similar situation in Acts chapter 2. Uh huh. We just hmm. Yep. Oops. What are we going to do? Was God Kill of, Peter. Was God kind of vague in his answer there as what they must do to be saved? Right. He wasn't here. Right. He isn't there either. Yeah. He says, baptized. Yeah. And boy, does the religious religious kingdom dumb, if you will. The dumb up. part of the yeah, kingdom. They really put that all up. Oh yeah. my goodness. I don't think it's that hard to understand. If you no. honestly read your New Testament, you will you come away with the idea that you would not be baptized. Selective saved. memory and mental gymnastics. <laughs> are not only provoked by fear. I don't know what these, maybe these people, I don't know what the deal is, but you got it. How do you get to baptism is not necessary by mental gymnastics and selective memory, right? Yes. Where to follow? 
certain because God is the one that's saying it. And, I mean, they're so controlled, that they're so controlled by fear at that point that they assume, that they block it out as soon as he says it. Right. Yep. And so, and so, what do you do when you see somebody in that situation? You say, "What, what, 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 what are they? Doing? What, what can you do?" And so, I'm here, and I'm dealing with the dude that's in the fear and not making the right decision. You say, "Hey," and they say, "Hey, can you help me here?" And you say, "Yeah, here it is." And then the next day, they're not in church, the very place they need to be to help their doubt. And you think to yourself. What do you do? Yeah, you, you keep on pulling. You keep on tearing your own hair out at the same time, right? You know, but you, you can't stop. At the same time, you're not the Pope. You know, you can't pass some edict. <laughs> not that it would be effective on them anyway, because they're not listening anyway. It's not been effective with the Pope. So. <laughs> <laughs> I find it interesting... If we stay, we'll die. What they fear is what ends up happening to them. By the way, this man, Joanna, who apparently was all the while, I don't know this for sure, but all the while seems to not have been a man of faith. I don't know. He, he seems to be a man of faith, and then he does this. So maybe he was a man of faith and then made a dumb mistake. Because there's that. Or maybe he seems to be a man of faith, like the rich young ruler, who seems to be a man of faith, but when you actually test him, it turns out, no, he never was. It was a matter of convenience all along. You know, he's more nationalist. Go Israel! Okay, and now to protect Israel, we're going to go to Egypt. It's had nothing to do with faith uh, the whole time. But what he says is, why, when he goes to Gedaliah, this man, when he goes to Gedaliah, he says, Gedaliah, somebody's trying to kill you. Let me go and kill him secretly. Why should he take your life so that all the Jews who are gathered to you would be scattered and the remnant of Judah would perish? And the very thing he doesn't want to happen, he causes to happen. How sad. No, we're never going to think we're doing the wrong thing. You know, I'm, I know I'm doing the wrong thing. <laughs> right? It's like, as you ask an interesting question, was he good or bad? I'm like, well, a little bit of both. Maybe yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or may, there might be a third option, but it's either he appeared to be righteous, doing some good things, but in fact wasn't a man of faith to begin with, because we see that all the time. And it's a threat. It might be me. I might be, oh yeah, I put up a good show, which I don't, I know that. <laughs> but but he puts up a good show, but man, he's not actually faithful. God knows. Or the situation might be that he's doing great. He's really doing great. He's doing some good things with the, with the faith he has. He's putting it to use. And then the, here comes this one, and wham, does he plummet. You know. They also had, by the way, verse 12 of chapter 42 and we'll be done pretty much about now chapter 42 I will also show you compassion so that he will have compassion on you and restore you to your own soil I God of the world am going to make the king have compassion on you and they had a living illustration of it right then and before them who was it who was the that king already having compassion on Okay, yes, I didn't even think of Jeremiah. That was the whole story, Jeremiah. <laughs> I'm thinking Daniel. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are out there, and the king is having compassion on them. God worked. That's the story of Daniel. My providence, I'm going to make you be the king's objects of compassion in my providence. They have that. Again, they have these, they have, uh, we were talking about it a second ago. I didn't finish this off. Do you remember in Numbers, Numbers 13, we can't go into the land. If we go into the land, if we go into this land of big giants, then what will happen? Do you remember what they thought would happen to their children? All the children will die. And God says, okay. And what actually happens, the opposite of what they say, God kills them. And he says to them explicitly, the thing you thought would happen to your children, the opposite will happen. Your children will live. 
These people had that. Wait, I'm scared. God can make the opposite happen, so I don't even know how that works out in space-time continuum. I just know I need to trust God. Right? They had that, and yet they, they just disregarded. They had all these tools, and now we have all the tools they had plus their story. And yet, I still do the same thing sometimes. So who am I to point fingers at these people and say, Joanna, you really messed that up. Well, he did mess it up, and every time I do the same thing, I really mess it up too. The finger points right back at me. Comments or questions? I'm all done for tonight. I guess we didn't get into 42 George. Um, a very broad observation. We talk about faith and leadership. A thing about both of those. Um, in, the, in the course of the conversation about Egypt and, and them being backed up against the wall here, and there was a time when they you know, crossed over the sea because God did that for them. I'm, I'm starting to be more and more convinced that nine tenths of faith is a good memory, really. Because it's a what? It's a good memory. Good memory. <laughs> Uh, because over oh, nine over tenths of faith is having a good memory. Is having right. a good memory because right. over and over again, if they would, if they would believe in what they already knew to be true in situations like that, looking, I mean, how how often is the is the appeal to us to remember and then insert? And right.